We crave what we're exposed to. Cravings are cultural. What your kid eats is based on the culture that they're exposed to. They're not gonna crave something that they're unaware of. You wrote a book about family, about connection, about food, about like how to do this together. The fastest path to change is through reward and through love and through what I call delicious experience. Sean Stevenson joins me today. He is the host of the Model Health Show, a number one, often number one, top ranked health podcast. You can check him out also on YouTube or whatever audio podcast app you like to listen to. Sean is just like one of those super awesome dope people who is cool, but also obsessed with science, obsessed with kind of like up leveling and helping other people do exactly that. So whether it's relationships, mindset, your body, your your family, the way that you sleep, the way that you eat, he's the guy you want to listen to. Uh, you probably have heard me talk about him endlessly, like sleep smarter was a game changer for me because I read that book about the same time I realized, oh wow, I need to change the way that I sleep. And most of the advice out there just, it didn't work for me, didn't feel practical. He followed that up with another great book that just became another number one seller and that is Eat Smarter. And not only do I love him, but I love his wife. I love their kids. They're so fun, they're so dope. And today we are just sitting down to talk about that. like how to up level your family culture, how to get healthier, how to, how do you improve not just your health, but like, how do you do this for your whole family? And more than just um, food and nutrition and exercise, like what does it mean to have a healthy family? So without further ado, I welcome to the show, my friend, Sean Stevenson. Oh my goodness, that's so awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting <laughs> me use your studio to bring you on to talk about a topic that's like super, um, really important to both of us. I want to lead off with your definition of a healthy family. Mm, How do wow. you know if you have a healthy family? Wow, what a question to start <laughs> with. You know, the first thing obviously, well, maybe it's not so obvious, mm. is that it's going to be unique. Mm. No family is the same. And But within that, of course, there are some core ingredients to okay. what a healthy family looks like. And, you know, some of the core pieces would be connection, mm. you know, and we say words like this, but like, what does that actually mean? This means being able to have this uh, uh, availability. You know, there's a statement that's seek first to understand and then to be understood, yes. right? So uh, an atmosphere of understanding, an atmosphere of curiosity, an atmosphere, and some of these words might sound, sound a little bit like some tough words, but an atmosphere of patience, Okay. And an atmosphere of growth as well, accountability, um, challenge, because another thing that is not talked about in the context of relationships, like we think this is the notebook, you know, this is not that. Real relationships, long-term healthy relationships are going to incite challenge. It's going to incite conflict. And so the ability also, of course, to navigate those challenges and those conflicts with an air of love underpinning it. You know, and so um, a, another core ingredient would be af affection. And okay. affection comes in different packages as well. But we all require closeness, you know, uh, touch, proximity. And, you know, it's going to be different depending on different people. You know, I even have different levels of affection and connection with my different family kids. members, yeah, you yeah. know, with my kids. You know, me and my older son is more like, there's a lot of <laughs> muscles involved in the in a hug, you know what I and mean? And a lot of dancing. And a lot of dancing, right? And, um, you know, we're def definitely quick to like link up on a dance move, you okay. know? Whereas my younger son, you know, we're very much more like close and kind of like huggy, like How feet on him. He's, he's 12, okay. he just turned 12. And Jordan and just turned 22 today. 23 today. 23 The Jordan today. year, it's the oh, Jordan year. Oh my gosh. And, um, you know, same thing. My wife comes from a culture where affection was kind of non-existent. Okay. You know, it's um, like she didn't see her, her father and mother like ever hug. Did or you? That kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, in spots. Okay. In spots. My, I had a model of my grandmother and grandfather. They were very oh, okay. loving. Well, that's why right? I wanted to walk you back. And, you, you know, so you've, and I don't want to stop you. If, if you, there's more mm -hmm. um, elements that you think are part of a healthy family, because what yeah. you haven't mentioned is anything about weight or exercise or food. Yeah. Are those included? That part, yeah. So yeah. even with that, there's... It, but I love that you started with like yeah. like the emotional stuff first. Yeah. That That's the stuff that influences those other things. Okay. 
you know, and the the crazy thing is we try to address the other things first yeah. and then try to have healthier relationships. Dude, right. And, you know, again, like this, these kind of misconceptions can happen to any of us. But I've really found I've been in the field right now. I'm about to cross 21 years Dang. Uh, this month. And so early on, of course, I was like, this is the way, whether it's like through food, whether it's through exercise, sleep, obviously, is a big part. All these things affect our health, but yeah. it's our relationships first and the quality of those affect everything else. And this isn't just hearsay, by right. the way. One of my colleagues who's sitting right in that chair that you're sitting in, he's the director of the longest running longitudinal study. This means they follow you around, life. basically, <laughs> right? On human longevity and wellness okay. yeah. ever constructed. It's been about, it's been over 80 years and it's had multiple directors. He's the latest to get the torch passed to him. And their data, and again, even him, he's very skeptical, which I love that in a scientist to be skeptical. Yeah. He couldn't believe their own data that had been compiled. And so he had to kind of retest things, outsource, check in with other researchers. But their data affirmed that the quality of your relationships is the number one influence on how long you're going to live. I need All to right. unpack that. And I'm going to. So yeah. I, I'm going to write myself a little note because hashtag <laughs> ADHD. But I want to know, did you have the elements that you just mentioned growing up? Like, did you have a household where people you felt understood where you felt connected where people were present where where there was patience I feel like my life was a big experiment you know um is that there, is the answer no there's a statement that God doesn't call the qualified God qualifies the called mm. right so life was Hello. kind of qualifying me to do what I'm doing today yeah. and this was regardless of what I thought my life was going to be I grew up in two very different atmospheres uh, my mom had me when she was barely 18 years old. Okay. If you see my birth certificate at my house, there's no father's name there. And it wasn't immaculate conception, you know, mm -hmm. from, from what mm -hmm. I <laughs> seen. But, you know, I've never met my biological father. Okay. And so, but my I, my stepfather came into the picture when I was just a baby. I was oh, okay. just under a year when they got together. Mm -hmm. And so I had that aspect of of a lifestyle with my mother and stepfather, but that was drugs, alcohol, inner city, violent environment. That's what that environment looked like. And when I, when I would go to stay at their house, because I'm gonna tell you about the other environment. Yeah. But to stay at their apartment on the weekends, I would be sleeping on the floor. There's like mouse traps, you know, mice, all the things. My mom worked at a convenience store overnight to, you know, just again, to put food on the table. My stepfather was a chef and Working at the convenience store, one of those evenings, she was stabbed eight times. You know, uh, I never knew off. this. Yeah, and I've, I've got t tons of stories like this. But even within that, by the way, a little sidebar. Um, you were she, how old when that happened? I was about six. Yeah, Damn. I was about six years old. And even within that, you know, she was defend fending off somebody trying to rob the store. Okay. And that's just kind of, my mom is really She's different. She's badass. She's tough, like different. And so, but they actually, she restrained the guy and the police got her. But anyways, but when After she- After being stabbed? Eight times. And so- She's- When she went to the hospital and they gave her the stitches and all the things, her physician told her that if you weren't so overweight, you would have died. <gasps> your, you being a heavy set woman saved your life. Do you think she's ever going to let that weight go? It protected her, just saved her life. And so this kind of like- Did it's that one message of those impact you? Like, was there a way, like, were you forming a belief about weight from that incident? I mean, I know you're young. Of course, there's these subconscious things. You know, of course, like, I'm, I'm glad that she survived that and that she did have that extra, whatever that looks like. But this is going to branch out after I tell you this other side mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to my, my entire, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, not one family member in proximity, not just my nuclear family, but branching out without one chronic disease or more. All right, and that's mm -hmm. what really what I grew up in. And so I had that environment, and at the same time, going to school from kindergarten till second grade, and also I stayed there a lot previously, just because sometimes my mom didn't have a place to stay, right? And so I would live with my grandmother. Okay. And this was, you know, I still remember the address, you know, this, uh, it was a very nice part of town. Okay. And I walked one block to my school, to the local school. There was so much certainty and safety and routine. You know, she would say 
prayers together with me each night. Mm. You know, she would basically, I had my own little table and chairs to like sit and have my dinner. Wow. And, you know, I had opportunity to, you know, all everything that I could imagine. For, for how many years? For three years, like really strong years, but these were like very impressionable years. Like really? I remember yeah. so much of this. Wow. And, but within that, I also saw the relationship between her and my grandfather. And there was so much love. I never saw them, I never saw a conflict. Not to say they didn't have it, sure. but there was just this underpinning of love and affection. And she had so much of that for me. That's where I got it. My mother, I can't remember my mother hugging me until I was an adult. Not to say that she didn't, not to say that she it's didn't. It happened every now and then like some random thing. But, you know, my grandmother, she was very affectionate towards me and just made me feel loved and seen. And if you had to pick one word to describe what you felt um, in that home, not from her, but in that home, what's the word or emotion you felt in your grandmother's home? Important. I felt important. That gave me goosebumps. Yeah. What one word would you use to describe the way you felt in your home with your mom and stepfather? Scared. <gasps> yeah. Does has that influenced the way you parent? Of course, it hasn't. You, it, it has no choice but to. And I didn't realize this early on. Of course, you just start to replicate things that you experience from your. Environment. You saying you felt scared makes me want to cry. Yeah, I mean that's just the environment that I was in, you know. And um, again, but he, even within this, this is what people don't understand if they don't come from where I come from. Mm -hmm. There was also so much beauty in this environment as well, mm -hmm. you know? So this is real talk, you know, there were times we live in places where, you know, there's gunshots, there's a chance to drive by if you're just outside playing. Um, Where'd you grow up? All over St. Louis. Okay. Which St. Louis, even today, unfortunately, is the murder capital of the United wow. States, all right? And so, and also just losing family members as well to, to you know, murder, prison, all those things. And there's a high likelihood that I'm following in those footsteps being in this environment. Because eventually, like, why did I move back with my mother at yeah. third grade? It's because my my grandfather kept having uh, heart issues. Hmm. And so they moved back to his hometown, southern Missouri, far away, that kind of thing. It was like a choice that was made between my mother and my grandmother for me to move back in with my mother. And so, but anyways, even within that environment where it's just like so much uncertainty. Yeah. There's also a lot of love as well. And also, by the way, we were getting food from charities. Like there's a place called the Hosea House, you know, food stamp, wick, all this stuff. Wow, again, my mom, they're trying to make ends meet. Mm. And, but this brought about this level of creativity being in this environment. So people see this kind of stuff like little, maybe in a movie, like putting the crate up on the pole to play basketball. Yeah, no, yeah. like we did that shit, yeah. like for real. And creating all these different games and finding creative ways to bond with our community, being able to be creative even with our food. And one of my most beautiful memories, because my stepfather just passed away just a couple weeks ago, actually, and he was in assisted living for almost 15 years because of brain damage from drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And we this was during the crack epidemic. Next door to that place that I'm describing, there was a crack spot. Just literally, there was a walkway, and then that's where it's getting made and sell, sold from. And so, but anyways, one of my fondest memories was all we had in the in the refrigerator. We had some pasta sauce was sitting on the shelf, okay, like some ragu or whatever it was. <laughs> and there was some frozen deer sausage from that my grandfather had hunted Venison. and sent up in the freezer. Okay, there was some government cheese, right? So they had block cheese, and there was some Texas toast that we got from the WIC program. And my stepfather made pizzas out of that. Wow. One day. Like we didn't have anything. We're like, you know, we're hungry, you know, like we don't have anything to eat. And he whipped that up. That's crazy. That's a core memory for you. And it didn't here, let's be clear, it didn't taste like Domino's. Right. But the fact that it was pizza. Yeah, it was pizza. We called the it. The fact pizza. that we ate it together. Yeah. Right? It was just because kids love that. Like I love pizza and like we made it. We got to have that. And I got this experience of this person making something out of nothing. And that skill, that that character trait, that inciting of creativity came from that environment as well how old were you when you like do you remember looking around and going like this is not healthy these people aren't healthy these people are, are ridden with disease i want to do different i'm going to do different at what age do you remember thinking that yeah and the thing is is it's it's imbued into both cultures because with my grandmother and my grandfather this was a transition time in the 80s you know the mid 80s yeah 
where processed food is just like even at my birthday party was down the street at the McDonald's. Oh yeah, um, you know. And so my and my grandmother wants me to to feel like I fit in because my friend next door, who's still my friend to this day, he's actually across the street and you know next door, uh, but he owns a gym now. Incredibly brilliant, but. You know, he got to eat like fish sticks and macaroni and cheese and all this stuff. I want to be like my friend. He's yeah. taking this to for for lunch to school, the little the juice baller. and all the thing. And so she would let me eat those things. I want to fit in, and mm -hmm. I didn't like my grandfather's venison. I didn't like. Oh, I didn't, was were they other like was Grandpa kind of healthy or no? I'll tell you that in one moment. Okay. So my grandmother had a garden as well oh. she had a cellar downstairs super super creepy by the oh, way i still have some basements and cellars apparent you know i'll pop in a, in a dream every now and then Absolutely. trying to run up those stairs <laughs> um but anyways so they had these things that were kind of ingredients in their life but when he had high blood pressure which that's all this that what the symptom was and his doctor told him he had to cut out the fat so they switched him from like butter and things like that to margarine partially hydrogenated yeah, vegetable sure. oil then he had heart attacks later. Uh, yeah. All right. You understand what I'm saying? So, yes, I do. So, but even within that, and my grandmother eventually developing diabetes, mm. um, in that environment, we are now, I'm getting programmed with ultra processed food consumption. Yeah. Because of love. That's the thing that people can miss as well. My grandmother wasn't trying to mess me up. She was showing love mm -hmm. through giving Absolutely. me food that I enjoy. We still do that. You know, and we all do that. And so that laid the foundation for my palate. And because of that, I didn't eat a salad until I was 25. It was the first time I ate a salad. Wow. All right, this is a true story. I was so driven, and even the data in my, in my newest book, right now in the United States, the average person, like just on a, we'll just say a, ra a random day in the United States, at least 80 million people are getting fast food. All right, and that's just, that's an everyday thing. So wow. you could tell people not to do it, but it's yeah. just a part of our culture. Yeah. And so I, that's where I picked up this. Mm -hmm. And then in the other environment, where am I noticing like the dysfunction? I already, just being in this place where I have so much certainty, as mm -hmm. soon as I come over, I'm seeing the chaos. Mm -hmm. The fear is is turned on. And also now I'm like, there's more freedom as well though. Like I'm getting to run out in the streets and do mm -hmm. things and like there's all these, there's these kind of seductive factors Absolutely. and there's like po pros and cons to everything. But what I really noticed just over time was you know, this practice, my, my mother would have me go across the street to get her uh, super big gulp. But then it turned to the double big gulp, which is the <laughs> one like they don't even have the container. You got to fold it up yourself. Oh, right. Wow. And so I'm doing this every day. But I get like a couple quarters. I can play video games and I'm buy, buying her cigarettes. This is when kids wow. can buy the cigarettes. That's so crazy. Vincent and Hedges menthol and this double big gulp or whatever it was. And just seeing over time my mom, not the fact that she was gaining so much weight but eventually she gave up. And what I mean is I came home from college um, just to visit, wash my clothes, of course. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, because the college that I was going to, which I chose to stay close by, uh, is maybe like an hour drive, if that. And my, my little brother was outside smoking uh -huh. on, the, on the front stairs. Okay. This is when we actually moved into that house that I grew up in with my grandmother. Okay. So my mother got that house okay. eventually. And I'm just, I'm furious. I'll go into the house, I'm like, mom, why are you letting him do this? Like disrespect us like this, disrespect our family. And she's just like, I'm tired, Sean, mm. I'm tired. I'd rather have him do it here than out in the streets. Were you consciously thinking like, I'm going to be a healthy person when you were young or did you not even think about it? I consciously knew that I was not going to be like this. Ah. I consciously knew that I wasn't going to create an atmosphere of fear for my children. I, con mm -hmm. I consciously knew that I was going to make a difference in the world. I didn't know what that was though. But these are the seeds that were planted for my grandmother and watered by my mother as well. You know, because despite all of that stuff, my mother really busted her ass to put me in position, you know, trying to get me into good schools, that kind of thing. You know, so it's just like, but I could, I could say, ignore that part and just talk about all the bad stuff. Mm. But that creates suffering for me. Right. You know, she was doing the best that she could with what she had. And the same yeah. thing with my stepfather. Yeah. You know, I just shared one of those core memories. It's such a beautiful experience that he gave me. And he gave me so many memories like that. Yes, there was a lot of negative things that happened. But I get to choose what I carry with me. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, I mean, it's... 
Why are you, I mean, listen, you, you talk about like, you are like one of the most researched people I've ever met. Like it's fascinating how your brain works. It's fascinating to just think, to hear your story of like how you grew up and the influences you had and how you, how people probably expected you to, things to turn out for you, yeah. right? And thank you for maintaining your edge too. You know what I mean? Like you're not like your typical science looking dude. Thank and um, I think that's part of the appeal. I know it is, right? Yeah. And also that voice that you use, like it's like slow jams, 98.9. Uh, <laughs> Quiet storm. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But you know, you and your show, like you, you really talk about again, like the science and studies and you break all this stuff down and you make it really palatable. People can consume it and understand it and and you you don't always take a, a stance. It's like, I'm just gonna lay this out for you and it should be pretty obvious. What is it though that um, makes family such an important piece? Like this latest book that you've written is about family. You could have written a book about any, like weight loss and it's like a guaranteed number one bestseller, right? You wrote, a book about family, about connection, about food, about like how to do this together. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting to hear your own backstory. But what you're taking on is so intensely difficult to change the way families eat. And why is, what is it that motivates you to do this? All right, so just even that lead in that it is incredibly difficult. Yeah. Right, that's attractive in and of itself for me, oh, my personality okay. type, but also the fact that you know, in all my years, the clinical work, all the speaking, all the teaching, all the writing of books, I saw that this was the biggest leverage point because both you and I have tried to, and, and successfully in many rights, but get people to target behavior changes. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. do this to get this result. Yeah, but what we don't realize a lot of times and why we blame other people when they not when they're not able to do the thing or they're not sustain it is that if you give people a behavior change and then they go into an environment that is anti that behavior right right, right. right the culture is completely opposite or even inundating them with behaviors that make that behavior change even foolish or you know whatever the case might be it's very difficult to make a healthy change in a culture that is unhealthy well, you say culture, but like it's even difficult in your own home. That's what I'm talking about specifically. Okay. Let's talk about culture. All right. Yeah, okay. So what is culture? Yeah, what is all culture? Right? Culture is defined as the attitudes, values, beliefs, behaviors of a group of people that's then passed on from one generation to the next. Okay. All right. That's what culture is defined as. Now we have macro cultures and we have micro cultures. The macro culture in the United States, currently, we are the sickest society in the history of humanity. Isn't that just history. like ridiculous? And by the way, let me this, I'm just going to throw, rattle out these facts. Okay, so right. CDC's data published just last year, 2022, 60% of Americans now have at least one chronic disease, 40% have two or more. We're knocking on the door of, right, this, we just passed prior to the pandemic, 42.5% of Americans being overweight or obese, I'm sorry, clinically obese and 72% being overweight or obese. Uh, 130 million Americans having type two diabetes, pre-diabetes. 60% of Americans have some degree of heart disease. 100 million plus Americans regularly sleep deprived. I can go on and on and on. Right. We're not doing well. No, we're not. But that is the larger culture scape. And we both have spent a lot of time trying to change that, Yeah. right? Don't go to the drive-through. But the drive-through just is, it's a thing. And it's going to exist. Where we have real power, is our microculture and what we do within our household. Okay. But even that starts with a cultural shift within ourselves because we ourselves are a, are a cultural vessel because what I saw, and even just recently taking my family to a place we've never been before, going, we went to Maui, we went to Hawaii. Yeah. And I saw that when you go somewhere, you take your culture with you. I'm a reflection of my culture. So you can plant me anywhere and I'm going to be an example or a model of where I come from. And that is infectious also. Yeah, yeah. True story, literally, even when we were sitting on the plane and people were walking by and they're just like, your family is so beautiful. You know, yeah. just like, because they saw us hanging out, I guess, before we got on the plane. Yeah. But you know what, uh, I'm just sorry to interrupt your story, but you know what people see that's so beautiful is how connected you guys are. 
I mean, you're, yeah, you're good looking people. Stop bragging. But it's not that because you see good looking families and they yeah. don't grab your attention that way. Like, I mean, th- you guys are um, an anomaly. How how connected you are. Continue. Thank you. And I didn't even think about the the like appearance part yeah. of it. I thought about the connection. You did. Part. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was the word she used, Humble. and I yeah. just oh, <laughs> we just talked. Because you guys are all, all very good looking. That doesn't hurt either. But yeah, it's that you. It's rare. You yeah. and when you do see it, it kind of like grabs your attention because people are so disconnected in, from their families. You know, yeah. mom and dad are looking down at their phones, and the kids are you yeah. know on their iPads and with headphones on. Yeah, we saw that. And in Maui, matter of fact. For whatever reason, we kept seeing the same couple when we go out to eat okay. at the resort restaurant. And I'm not exaggerating. Every time, we probably saw them four times for four meals and they would be some proximity to us. They didn't even look at each other. They were just on their phone. They ate their food. Yep. Even eating, wow. they were looking at their phone. Jeez. This couple, and they Come were probably on. like in their late 20s. Wow. And I was just like, wow, that's a real thing. Yeah. And, you know, but okay, of course, I'm, I, I try to see the positive stuff. I'm just like, well, at least they're here. You know, they got to walk together or whatever. Like... But at the same time, it's just like we are we are experiencing something that is very disruptive to connection. Right. We've never had this kind That's of access to technology. So true. And so I was saying that point to say that even there, people were coming up to us at the resort as we're hanging out. But now that you even just said that, it's because we were like we were playing. We were in a spirit mm. of play. We were mm-hmm. like we were connected. That's really what it was. Yeah. People aren't coming over like, how your son get these muscles, you know? But <laughs> they might be curious about that. Because Jordan but, was flexing. I mean, he can't help it. Yeah. You know, he's a flexitarian. Yeah, he's he's fl- he has the we're ability call to him flex. Mr. Thirst Trap. <laughs> okay. And we're gonna he put we're gonna that. put a little clip of him right here, and we're gonna give him a little Instagram shout out. Okay, continue. You're welcome, son. <laughs> You're welcome. So you know, again, we we take our culture with us. We are a product of our environment. Absolutely, but yeah. we're also creators of our environment. Okay. And so now here's the other part. As I went to that culture in Maui, I saw something on display that was affirmed in all the studies that are in this new book. And by the way, when you talk about the science, there's never been a, a cookbook like this before. There's over 250 scientific references in a cookbook. That's crazy. Directing us towards like, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. But going there, we see this kind of dramatization of something that was a part of all of our heritage for them, it's a luau, right? Yeah. It's the procurement of food, the hunting, the gathering, the food preparation, and then the celebration together. Yeah. We evolved with that. Yeah. That's how humans evolved. And so to see it on display and this kind of, again, dramatization of this thing that has been pulled away from our culture. And so my question was this, could this process of eating together be something that our genes need, that our DNA expects from us that's possibly leading to the behaviors that we're doing and the Mm -hmm. poor health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is where everything changed. By me asking that question, that sent me down to, you know, like I mentioned my friend who's the director of that long running longitudinal study with, with health, some other researchers at Harvard compiled all this data on eating behaviors, families eating together, and health outcomes. Okay. And I was like, when I found, first when I saw it, I'm like, how is this not like everywhere? This is really, people should know this, but, I, but it's I like there was a lot of stuff. We do know it. I we mean, do know it, We right? do know it. Yeah. And and so, you know, that's the, that's the thing. Like you talk about a culture, right? And you know, it starts with us. But Sean, there's so many homes, and I mean, I have close friends, where there's two cultures within the home mom and sometimes dad are doing something completely different from their kids. Like mom and dad are eating green salads and and avoiding processed foods. And then they're buying all the things that, you know, you talk about this in the book, the things that have the cartoons on the box and because their kids want it and they want it. So we're going to give it to them. And we feel disconnected to, I think our kids in so many other ways or you know, maybe it's a blended family and we're not seeing our kids all the time. So we just feel like I want to get, give them all that they want because this is love. That's number one. And number two, I want to say this. This is speaking from personal experience. I sometimes, if I'm being honest, would live vicariously through what my kids got to eat. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. eat that. Yeah. But like their metabolisms are through the roof. You know, they've, they've got abs and they're running around like crazy. So... I desperately want to eat these, you know, uh, pink. Gl- th- my downfall with those pink cookies that had like little sprinkles on top. They're like cake cookies. 
at like Ralph's, you know, the ones mm-hmm. I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I, know I buy those about. every week for my kids. I did. Yeah. And those are garbage. That's garbage food. <laughs> that is crap. Yeah. And I would buy it for them because I was like, they can eat. I was living vicariously through them. So that was like a splintered culture within my home. And I think this is happening a lot. So how do you, how do you, how do you get us? I'm going to throw myself into that, you know, this yeah. pot. Like, how do you get us to understand, like, it needs to change through for the whole family? Yeah. Well, the, the cool thing about this is that I'm not speaking about this through some idealistic lens. I'm, I'm speaking about this from where I, I've experienced this. Yeah. I have this very unique experience growing up in two distinctly different households. Yeah. And within one of those, although this one looks like the more this kind of more structure and, you know, health health affirming, but my my grandmother was giving me those. They weren't eating that at the time. Oh. She was giving me those ultra processed foods because she wanted me to be happy. Yeah. Right? So I know what that's like. And so, but here's the reality. She is the queen of the culture. She's the queen of the culture. Yes. All right. You see, that, you already yes. know where I'm going. And so this is un- this is where we put the power back in our hands, but we have to be more intentional about the culture that we're creating. Regardless of where you are right now with the ages of your kids, you are still a benevolent leader. Benevolent. And, yeah. You could be benevolent dictator, but you have so much influence. And this speaks to, we have to, we talked a little bit about this earlier as well, but un- know your kids. Right. Being mm. able to pay attention to mm. what excites them. Yeah. And what de excites them, what motivates them. We were talking about this when we were doing my show. Yeah. Um, what motivates them. We know those things, but sometimes because we just want people to do what we want them to do, yes. we don't we don't take the time to just like pay attention and yes. to be able to communicate. And we do this also with our significant others as well. If you would just act right, don't kill my vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, then everything's going to be good. But people are not going to do what you want them to do all the time. Right, which is why so, in the book you talk about, and I, it reminded me a lot of, it's just your through line of everything you do, which is like, it's it's attainable. Like yeah. that's why Sleep Smarter worked for me. That's why Eat Smarter works for people. Um, and you talk about in the book how, like don't flip everything upside down. All you're gonna get is everybody to revolt and like running at you with pitchforks. Yeah. Like, don't do that. So, give me a specific. Like, my kid loves and is gonna throw a fit if tomorrow morning they don't get their sugary cereal. I can't come home with something, you know, that's the healthy version of that. Yeah. How, how, what do I do if, if they just won't eat then? I, I heard from so many people, they're like, please ask him, how, how do I handle my picky eater? Oh, yes, of course. So, all right, I'm going to talk about the biggest factor with this, Mm -hmm. which is we touched on it already briefly, but today we're more fractured, you know, from from our family structure. And so a lot of times these habits that our children get pulled into. Yeah. What I want to say, well, let me start by saying this. Cravings are cultural. What your kid eats is based on the culture that they're exposed to. They're not going to crave something that they're unaware of. And so it's the introduction of these things mm-hmm. in the first place that we have to take responsibility for. We can't just say that it's someone else's fault. We are creating these kind of um, these connections and they're very strong neuro associations that we have to food. One of my other kind of base food memories was my great grandmother. I got to spend time with her, Momo. All right, my great grandmother. Uh-huh. And there was like a senior citizen bus uh-huh. that would go from the, the home, the group home and to the grocery store and I went with her and we came back to her place. She made me a bowl of Fruity Pebbles. Oh I yeah. I was probably like four years old, four or five years old. You just let them soak until the milk turns it pink? right now. <laughs> I could taste it, all right? And again, it's laying down. Guess what? I want more of that. Yes. That is, that is chemically designed by brilliant food scientists to create that kind of connection to my brain, to my physiology, yeah. to make me crave this thing that is so ab- abnormal. It's just nothing real about it. Right, at all right. this is the definition of an ultra processed food yeah. and so first of all we've got to have some compassion for ourselves okay but also responsibility the compassion is you're not alone my book is the first published piece of work demonstrating this new study that just came out this was published in JAMA the Journal of the American Medical Association they looked at the diets of American children the past about 20 years mm-hmm from 1999 to 2018. Okay. In 1999, the average 
American child's diet was made of 61% ultra processed fake food. 61%, okay. By 2018, that number was 67.5%. Almost 70% of our child's diet here it's in the United fake. States is made of fake food, ultra processed food. And what does that mean? This is not like processing. Humans have been processing food forever. Yeah. It's not like taking meat and cooking it or olives and pressing yeah. the oil out. Yeah. This is a field of corn or wheat eventually becoming that bowl of Lucky Charms or Fruity Pebbles in my right. food Pink memory sugar case. coated all of those whatevers. chemicals, food dyes, preservatives, additives, the whole nine, all right? Not to mention this ab incredibly abnormal amount of sugar that's just siphoning itself through the human body very, yeah. very quickly, including our brains, by the way. The human brain is maybe like 2% of our body's mass, but it will gladly, and this is according to researchers at Harvard yeah. again, it will pull in 50% of the sugar you just consumed will get shuttered to your brain mm -hmm. because our brains evolved looking for that glucose source. Yeah. But now we've got so much of it. So, but yeah. How, how, do I, how? Okay. Okay. Like, I get this. I think anyone who's listening, like, they're like, I know this. I know this. No, I know this. They, we but don't it's know hard. this. We don't know this because but it's hard. My kid's going to be unhappy and all of his friends are eating this stuff. And then they're going to complain. And I don't have time because we're running late and I, I don't have time to fight this battle. What do you say to that parent? Like, what, just what responsibility do we have to be the parent? Okay. Last point with that was, we don't know that our kids are addicted. We're, we're mm. little addicts, all mm. right? And big addicts. This stuff is very, very powerful. Yeah. So trying to rip the Band-Aid off is not the solution either. Okay. We've got to understand what we're dealing with here. This is a very strong neuroassociation, our connection to food. So with that said, you just said another kind of key phrase, which is, I don't have time for this. Yep. That's what I was starting with. And I was trying to set the story of like, this. these are the conditions that we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. It's It's pretty dire and complicated. But at its core, it's something that we oftentimes don't want to deal with. It's That's right. hard. That's right. It's hard, but it's you get to choose your heart, <laughs> all right? Because that path that they're on right now, yeah. that we're on as families, mm -hmm. is going to lead to disease and dysfunction. We know mm -hmm. where that's headed. Mm -hmm. Or we can do the work right now wherever we, our children are at. But here's the thing, and this is now let's talk about what we can do. Okay. Thankfully, my life experience has shown me and also clinical work, it is the the fastest way to something not working is through suffering. Mm -hmm. All right? You could suffer your way into changes in culture and body change and different health practices. Sure. But it's very difficult to sustain, sustain something that you hate. Right. All right. And also, you have to understand humans, we love freedom. We love our idea of freedom. Yeah. We don't necessarily... It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have the freedom. And so what I mean by that is our culture determines what choices we make. And what I mean by that is, for example, a culture will just say, you just came back from Italy, right? Yep. And so that culture that you saw eating all this wonderful food, kind yeah. of closer to proximity of where they came from, yes. going for a walk every evening, if they don't have a 7-Eleven in that old Kind Which of they didn't. town. That's right. They're not really aware that people are eating funyuns, mm. right? If, if if it's not in their proximity, that's right. They're not going to have a craving like you know what? I really want some hot Cheetos right. right now. Yeah. We crave what we're exposed to. Cravings are cultural. Okay. Right. And so, with that being said, what we what we need to do here is understand that the the fastest path to change is through reward and through love and through what I call delicious experiences. Okay. And so we know what we're up against. I already set the yep. the the table for that. Pun intended, set the table. <laughs> um, but now we've got to come in here. We have to provide something of equal or greater value. Okay. That's the solution. You can't just take the cereal away and not expect the townspeople what, to revolt. Give me an example. Right? I so, want a specific example. All right, all right. Um, now, okay, so we've got to, of course, knowing our, ch knowing yeah, our yeah. child. Yeah, yeah. Number one, a huge leverage point is we like options, but not yes. too many. Okay. All right. So if you're just like, I'm taking your cereal away. And you get and, this. And you get this, right? Instead, you come in with an option, right? So maybe it's just like, okay, so today you're going to, uh, or today do you want, you know, this blueberry, you know, ice cream smoothie or ice cream 
Yeah. Okay. Or oh. do you want, you know, whatever the other option is, you know, Love it. Eggs. Bre breakfast burrito, right? <laughs> right. So like come to, come to the table Smart. with options, but also speaking to where they are, you know, what, what is attractive to your child. And also this, but you have to deliver on that. You yeah. can't just say this is blueberry, you know, ice cream smoothie or whatever. And it tastes like whatever, you know, yeah. we've got to make this delicious. Okay. And we can do that with real foods, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's part of the problem is there's this like dichotomy, like healthy means right. lack yeah. versus, right? And I remember, you know, my bro my little brother, my little sister, you know, coming from this environment, <laughs> it was maybe like, I don't know, maybe like 15 years ago, I went over to his house and I just transformed my health. I was helping all these people now. And we were standing outside, you know, yeah. it's kind of, you know, still tough vibes, you know, and, uh, you know, tough guy vibes. Right, right, and he's right. he's like, I heard you eating organic. It's organic. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, you know, basically I eat the same thing you do. It's just not sprayed with pesticides and fungicides and herbicides. And you yeah. know, I shared a little bit like, you know, these are very whatever. And he just kind of looked like, but that's healthy food though, right? Like he, for him, it's like, it can't be as good as what I'm eating because Absolutely. it's yeah. organic. That's right. right. So it's a mindset. It's a mindset. Right. And because also we've been inundated with ultra processed food, all of our advertising that triggers the deliciousness, yeah. the pizza pulling in the commercial, you know, the alcohol, all those every commercial you see is for ultra processed foods. That's right. Right. We don't have there's not like a omelet commercial. You know what I mean? It's just like we've got to understand what we're dealing with. But in, let me give an example. So humans have been driven to eat sweet things forever, but we villainize our desire for sweet things. It's its very silly. And I'm saying this because, for example, what that would indicate through our evolution is that there's a dense source of energy here in this sweet thing, which would generally be honey or mm. sweet fruit or yeah. even semi-sweet fruits. Mm -hmm. And also that's energy to shuttle to the brain and to also stockpile some energy potentially if we come across a, fa a famine. And so we've evolved with these drives to eat sweet things. But yes, food manufacturers have manipulated that desire today but are those is our desire for sweetness bad absolutely not as a matter of fact honey which i just mentioned and i shared over 40 specific foods that have all of this science to affirm this i'm very bullish on honey right now mm -hmm. because there's so many different sweeteners out there and they go in and out of favor yeah. the debates of artificial and even natural ones yeah. quote natural ones that still look like sugar by the way processed mm -hmm. sugar mm -hmm. but i shared a study in the book that found that not only does honey not cause this abnormal glucose spike like other sweeteners, but long term, it can actually improve your fasting blood glucose by eating honey. That's abnormal for a sweetener. Why would it do that? Also uh, dramatically improving blood lipids, so blood fats, and essentially reducing your risk of cardiovascular disease. To call honey a sweetener is it's like put some respect on my name right? it's like it's not it's not just a sweetener yeah. it's so much more than that yeah and it's been prized for thousands of years so honey for example like getting your kid to switch from whatever it is that they're using like sugar on top of their cereal to honey maybe mom's doing that like but how do we get this culture and the family yeah. together like again i think oftentimes mom or dad are doing something that's healthier than what they're doing for their kids. Yeah, the most important thing here, and you talked about this when I interviewed you as well, is the modeling. And yeah. where, do you kid, where do your kids actually get to see you doing these things? Even when we're working on our fitness, a lot of times it's like my mom is going to this gym place mm. and she's doing stuff, she comes back all sweaty and happier. Like where is she really going, you know? Yeah. Instead of like, let's involve our kids in some aspects of this, give them okay. exposure. Where do we get this exposure with food? It's at the dinner table. And by the way, when I say dinner table, this could be breakfast, this could be lunch. But what I was sharing earlier was we evolved eating together. That was a part of how we connected. And suddenly that's been pulled away from our culture. And when I say suddenly just in the last couple of decades, currently only about 30% of families eat together on a regular basis, according to that data from Harvard I mentioned. And what they found was that when families eat together on a regular basis, the children have a significant increase in consumption of real food, including the intake of essential nutrients that prevent chronic diseases and a redu significantly reduced intake of processed foods like wow. chips and soda. All right, one more study. Yeah. Another study, this was a, two different studies I'll put together to, to kind of wrap this up. 
published in pediatrics and published okay. in JAMA, they found that when families eat together just three times a week, the children have significantly lower onset or risk of developing obesity and other kind of disordered eating as well. And so again, this is just stacking conditions yeah. for our families by having that practice. There's something about eating together with your family. This doesn't mean we're automatically gonna eat super healthy food. Okay. And for me, I gotta share this last one, this is super fast. I was like, well, what about if we don't have a lot of money? Because that's where I come from. Yeah. And there was a study that was done, and I highlight all of these things, pretty much everything we've covered is in the book as well. Yeah. But looking at minority children who are generally in the context of a low-income community, yeah. and they found that these children who ate together with their families four times a week, whatever meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, four times a week, ended up eating five servings of fruits and vegetables five days a week, and significantly lower intake of chips, soda, and other processed foods. There's something What's protective. going on there? What do you think it is? Two things. Well, there's actually five things, but two <laughs> quick things. Number one is that this engages a part of our mind of planning, right? So humans, we're always kind of thinking about things, questioning things. We've got running questions in our mind, like what are we gonna eat? Like family dinner is Wednesday night. So it's just in the back of our mind. And so it's just going to alter our behavior subconsciously to like make sure that we are eating a quote, healthy dinner or a, or a well combined, what we deem to be a healthy dinner, which might be, you know, some fried chicken and potatoes and whatever, but even that is gonna have a tendency towards bringing in some more f real food elements. So if I hear you correctly, mm -hmm. if I can restate this, just start by trying to eat together more often and like make that step one. You don't have to switch everything out to organic quinoa and broccoli, you know, yeah. if, if you've been bringing home KFC. Bring home KFC, but this time sit down and eat together and just do this in a way that's gradual and everyone doesn't revolt. Here's why it works is that okay. now you get to see your child. Yeah. You get to see them. You get to really start to understand their 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 character traits, their how they speak, uh, what they're attracted to. That's how you have power to help to change what they're eating. We have to spend time knowing your child. And this is one of the greatest challenges mm. today because we're so disconnected. We all have our devices. Our devices are divisive. They Oof. just are. And with that, they can also be a unifying thing. They have their pros and cons, but at the at the table, this is an opportunity to really see them and for them to feel seen. And that changes the whole game right there in and of itself. So again, we come into this like, I have a picky eater. We have to be attentive and it's harder today. We can do it though. And this is some of the other things that we talk about because there isn't a one size fits all with any of this stuff, by the way. Mm. And sometimes- Okay, that's fair. And, and by the way, it isn't to villainize that food as well. Like that damn cereal can still be a thing. Let's stack conditions and make sure we're getting in these other things. Okay. And here's another thing that tends to happen is that information from that real food that's coming in. Food isn't just food, it's information. It starts to shift the body's intelligence yeah. and what you start to crave, you know? So all this is kind of stacking conditions for, for people. I told people, you know, everyone loves you and you've been on the show a bunch of times. And so, you know, I told me you're gonna be on the show. I told them what we were gonna talk about. And I said, when I tell you the concept of this book, which is a mission for you, right? I mean, like this is an initiative. You went into this with an intention. It's about family. It's about the people that we love. And if we, if we say we would lay our lives down for our kids, if we say like, I would do anything to help my child avoid pain, we have to look at what we're doing that's going to cause them pain in the long run. But I asked him, I'm like, when I tell you what the, you know, the title of the book is Eat Smarter and it's it's a family cookbook. And it's about, you know, eating together and eating healthy and, and learning to do these things together. And I said, hit me right away with your first thoughts of why you can't do this. And Sean, like every message, almost every message, very similar themes. Um, we're all busy, no one's home at the same time, all picky eaters, um, we're just not on the same page. Uh, just a lot of this has to do with, we're all going in a million different directions. Mm. So how do we get people, like, who, like that's a real thing. Yeah. You know, uh, Elizabeth has volleyball tonight and um, Duke has uh, football and so, we're, we're my husband's gonna go this way i'm gonna go that way we're coming home a different, like how do we get them yeah. to do this and mm -hmm. i think we always think dinner yeah but maybe the problem is the culture that's <sighs> that's separating us and creating us so that everybody's running in different directions <sighs> 
if we say that our family is the most important thing to us, and I know many of us would, that's what we say, but what is our life show? How are we actually living our lives? And not to say again, we've all got responsibilities, there's a lot going on. My son, he just started playing AAU basketball in Los Angeles. It's a lot. Yeah. These tournaments, is like it sucks up so much. But I found creative ways to make this work, right? And so sometimes when we travel, right, this is an opportunity for us to bond. Sometimes even if the game is just, you know, an hour and a half away and we can drive back, maybe we might get a room, him and I, and just spend time together and sit down and eat dinner together. Yeah. And maybe just hang out and then watch a movie after. Like I find ways because he's my priority to connect with him. And it's harder today. It is. It absolutely is. But there is a way. And so, you know, even with that being said, that's going to be a lot of the the resistance. Yeah. But I, my mission is to let's stack conditions to make it easier for us to make healthier choices. Let's stack conditions to make it easier to connect. And here's another big takeaway for everybody. Quality over quantity. Mm. This doesn't mean that you need a whole elaborate whatever, you yeah. know, two hour whatever. This can be 30 minutes of sitting down and having coffee. Right. Or, you know, I make my son this little hot cocoa whenever he's out of school, school. So, you know, just sitting down and, you know, having a, a, a beverage together, a little snack, but just spending time, be present. Wow. And putting the devices to the side so you can yes. actually be there with the people yes, you yes. care about. I mean, that's why I love this book. Um, and people need to get on the pre-order of this book ASAP, depending on when you're listening to this or watching this, um, because it's, it's important. And I know you love your family. I know that you would would lay your life down for them and the the studies and the information that you share in this book is so powerful it's these kinds of things that once you know it you can't go back you know what i mean but also that it's almost less about the food and more about the connection yeah. and that when you started this episode our time out today you said a healthy family you didn't mention food but all of these things are only possible if we're connected and we've got to find a way to do that. And so um, the book is Eat Smarter, the family cookbook. Yeah. And people, like, of course, I, I love me, you know, an iPad. I love um, encouraging people to, you're thinking about it right now, so you should go grab the book. Like, we'll put a link below in the show description. Is there another place you want to recommend people to go check it out? We got to say this last piece, which is, the secret sauce to all of this is the delicious food. My family and Dude. I were big foodies. And so when we're talking about recipes. Listen, but when we're talking about something like my kid with the candy, we have snicker bites in the book. Like we're just upgrading the ingredients. For me growing up, I was a huge fan of breakfast sandwiches. Like going yeah, to McDonald's, yeah. like I have this upgraded breakfast sandwich that's gonna knock your socks off. It's one of my kids' favorite breakfasts. We're big brunch family. We love pancakes. So we have these sweet potato protein pancakes. This has to be done through the the language of deliciousness. Yeah. Right. Give people things that are of equal or like greater value. Like the burgers, value. the the fry. Yeah. You've got avocado fries. Like so many delicious recipes. Yeah. But um, also, it's a beautiful book. It's beautiful. Your family's involved in it, and you just you the love pops off the page. This is a great resource for anyone. Um, but Sean, I know this is something that's really important to you. You've been able to change the cult. You've been able to change the legacy, your family's legacy. And it's pretty powerful to think the thousands, perhaps millions of people's families whose legacies, you have the ability to impact them in this way. Um, and and it, guess what? It, it does take work and it takes intention. And I think if you love your family, if you even if you're, it's your spouse, like maybe we're talking to people right now who don't have uh, kids, but you, you have family. Maybe live with your parents. And so I encourage everyone to pick up the book. Thank you. And of course, people can pick it up anywhere. Books are sold, okay. pre-ordered, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and go to eatsmartercookbook.com. Okay. That's where we have all the incredible bonuses, which you are part of the 2023 Family Health and Fitness Summit yes. as well. So you get free admission to that. It's $300 and you get it for free. Okay. So it's going to be amazing. We're doing a bunch of giveaways for fitness equipment and food and all kinds of cool Every stuff. Every time you launch a book, you you put together these incredible bonuses that are just like next level. <laughs> Amazing. So I will put the link to that so people can go there and get those bonuses because like why wouldn't you, right? Thank you so much for letting me use your studio, for being such a great friend and being such an incredible role model to not just uh, moms and dads but humans. Like you're such a great husband and a great friend so I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Shalene. That means everything. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. When our fat cells are overly full, 
they start to send out sort of this false distress signal, pulling in immune factors as if you're infected. And so researchers at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine found out how this is connected 